started how wonderful to have you all here for our second webinar and thank you for those of you who are coming back for more that's a good sign and thank you to those who are coming for the first time we hope that you managed to catch up with the first webinar on YouTube and we are recording this tonight because it's useful to people um, and we hope it will be useful to you if you're not happy with any of that obviously just let us know so we're exploring how to reawaken your better nature to improve your life and the life of the world around us. And uh, I am Jane Moat, you might have met me last time, a journalist, used to work at the BBC um, in news. And uh, I really do believe that us human beings can do better. And I'm gonna try and do my very best tonight to keep things rolling um, smoothly. But the person who's really making the pedals go round is uh, Viv. Viv, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly and tell us uh, how this all works? Hello everybody. Um, so my name is Viviane Ducey and uh, most of you actually know me as Viv. Um, we're encouraging uh, debate and discussion and uh, please post your questions in the chat and your contributions. So um, if you have a question then you can uh, prefix it with a Q. Um, so today we've got roughly 60 people on board. We've actually had bookings for 75, so we're probably still clocking them in at the moment. Um, mostly, of course, we cover the southeast of England, but uh, we also have um, family from Norfolk on at the moment. So very welcome to you all. Thanks a lot, uh, Viv. And uh, tonight we are joined, as always, because this is the point of this, is to have Tony uh, Whitbread and also Paul Hannum. Paul, uh, for those of you who might have missed your talk last week, can you just briefly introduce yourself? So I'm Paul Hannum. Um, I live in Bramber in Sussex. I used to live in California with scenery a little bit like uh, the one behind me. I've worked in the environmental sector now for well over 20 years um, as an academic, uh, taught in England and California, um, had several environmental businesses. But most of my work at the moment is, is writing, I, I write books, I do a lot of work in the field of psychology, where, which is where most of my training was. And I've really decided to dedicate myself to, you know, doing whatever we can really to stop the climate and ecological breakdown that we're facing. And uh, uh, most recently, I've been very much involved in my local community and I'm co-chair of uh, Greening Stenning and Tony is very pivotal in that as well. Thanks very much. And Tony, do you want to introduce yourself too? Yes. Hello there, everybody. My name's Tony Whitbread. Um, I've been interested in the environment and I've been an ecologist, I suppose, since I was a wee lad. Uh, worked for 27 years with the Sussex Wildlife Trust, uh, 12 of them as chief executive, and I'm now their president. I suppose my interest is in, um, in ecology, obviously, uh, how nature works, how nature functions. And of course, that brings you into, well, how, how do humans interact with nature? And what's our place in nature, which is, I suppose, the subject of the talks and discussions today. Yes, we're certainly going to be hearing a lot from you, Tony, um, in particular today. Now, last time we introduced uh, the need to change our human story to make it less toxic. And remember that community and cooperation are within human nature. And today we'll be exploring our relationship with nature, how we are part of it, not separate from it. And before Tony kicks off, um, I just want you to uh, close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think about your early childhood and think or imagine your earliest enjoyable experience. You got it? Right. What I need you to do now is to answer a simple question. Was this experience outside in nature or indoors? And if you're able to click on one of the questions that's on your screen now, then please do click away. If it's too difficult, don't worry, because we can, um, we can you know, just ask you, hold it in your imagination. But let's just see uh, what, what people have got in their minds, where their, their earliest enjoyable experience uh, happened. And when the clicker starts to, to diminish in numbers, then I will... Um, I'll reveal the poll results. Didn't know you were getting in for this this evening. So let's share the results. Um, before we do, 
Tony, do you want to guess or not? Do you want to see it? Uh, no, I'm not going to guess. I'm, okay. going to, I'm going to see what happens. I can, yes. Here well, we go. Look at that. So there we go. Uh, yeah, 90, I haven't got the 94% um, experience. The most enjoyable early experience was outside in nature. Was that a surprise to you, Tony? <laughs> Actually, no, it wasn't. I've done, I've done this before and, that, and actually uh, it is very interesting because uh, judging my audience carefully here, in our sort of age group, that's the sort of result we get. The worrying thing is if you do this to progressively younger audiences, then the, the proportion of people who have their first memorable, pleasurable experience indoors increases. So it's a sh it shows how, how we're losing contact with nature with time. And there seemed to be a big change around 20 or 30 years ago from Again, 70, 80, 90 percent of people first being first pleasurable experience outside, and then it all suddenly seems to change. So very interesting. In in terms of this this separation at an early age, I mean, does why does why does th why do things change, and and why is it important that we we don't experience this separation? Well, yes, this this is this is the point of, of today actually, and uh, and this session is about our our contact with nature, our relationship with nature, and uh, the need for a changing relationship with nature. Um, we get this wrong, and all sorts of things go wrong. I mean, the very fact we get we're in the middle of a pandemic is a direct result of our bad relationship with nature. We've actually had a huge influence on increasing the likelihood of pandemics because of the way we interact with nature. Now, what I wanted to start off with is to bust some myths that we've actually, um, the, the myths that have been busted over the last several centuries. About uh, five, six hundred years ago, we are supposed to have gone through the, the Renaissance, through the Age of the Enlightenment. And at that time, we moved from, from bigotry and superstition uh, to science and rationality. We, 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 mo we moved from a previous age into the present age. And that's supposed to have been what happened about 600 years ago, something like that. And uh, some of the great myths were, were busted at that point, like humans and the Earth being at the centre of the universe. Uh, that, was, that was held to be true for a very long time. Well, Copernicus broke that myth. The other myth was that uh, humans were completely separate from animals. We're a different sort of organism altogether. Uh, we, we, we just don't, don't fit into the animal kingdom at all. We're separate from all of that. Well, that myth was busted by Darwin. But we're still living with a great myth. And actually, I would argue that we haven't actually gone through the Renaissance properly yet. We've still got some way to go. And the myth we're living with now is that humans are separate from, are different, live different, different, by different rules. Like we can ignore, we can destroy, we can trade the environment. We have this myth that we are somehow, those rules that affect every other, other animal and plant don't affect us. So this is the last of the great, great myths. I'd say the Renaissance has actually faltered. The Age of Enlightenment has faltered. It hasn't finished yet. We're still living with a bigotry, which is actually about us being totally separate from nature. And that's what I'd like to challenge today. Um, in summary, we don't live on a lifeless rock. We live on a living planet. That's a reasonable summary of the, of the, of the planet we live on. Life creates the conditions to support life. Now we say that sort of thing, but what, what, what does it actually mean? Uh, let's picture the world without life on it. What would it be like? Well, we know because we have an idea from about three or four billion years ago what, what, the, what the atmosphere would have been like. And at that time, it was probably 95% carbon dioxide. What it should be today is 0.03% carbon dioxide. Think of the difference there. Our atmosphere would be more like Venus if it wasn't for, for life on Earth. There would be no oxygen. The seas would be acidic. We'd be bombarded with solar radiation. There'd be no ozone layer. There'd be massive swings in climate. It would be unrecognisable. We live with an Earth system. Describing it as a living planet is a reasonable summary. Now, what I was then trying to think about was, well, that's quite, that should be quite illustrative in itself. But I was trying to grasp, well, what's the size of this living system? What's the size of this kind of cycle that we're talking about? And one measure is by looking at the carbon cycle, because we kind of know about the carbon cycle. Um, but uh, it's nice to kind of grasp the size of that. So if we look at this slide here, um, we, we know that, for example, car uh, carbon is taken out of carbon dioxide, is taken out of the atmosphere by green plants and actually sequestered by green plants using the sun as, a, as, an, earth, earth, as, a, as, a, as an energy source. So and that's about 770 billion tonnes a year is drawn out of the atmosphere by green plants, half in the sea, half on land. Okay, 770 billion tonnes of carbon, that's a lot. 
On, on the other hand, there's 770 billion tonnes of carbon which animals uh, respire. Well, also by decomposition, you can see in the bottom left hand corner there, there's a dead elephant. That's to represent decomposition. So here we have a kind of Mickey Mouse diagram of the carbon cycle, a nice happy earth in the middle there because the same amount of carbon sequestration, same amount of locking, locking up carbon on the right hand side as there is emissions on the, on, on the left hand side. So that's the carbon cycle. Well, that, well, they're big numbers, but again, how big are they? That's in a year, 707, 770 billion tonnes of carbon. Well, as a measure, the total weight of all life on the planet is 550 billion tonnes. So you can get a grasp of how active this whole cycle is. There's more carbon cycled in a year, more weight of carbon than the entire weight of all life on the planet. And then there's nitrogen, which does roughly the same thing as well. And there's oxygen, which does the same thing as well, and phosphorus and sulfur and so on. So all these cycles are going on on an absolutely vast, massive scale. Of course, it's not quite that simple, obviously, because uh, we're adding another uh, a net 20 billion tonnes of, 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 uh, of carbon to the atmosphere on top of that. So the Earth isn't quite as happy as I, as I implied in that, uh, in, in that diagram there. Um, so we're, what we're doing is unsustainable. We're adding 20 billion tonnes above what the Earth can actually cycle. So every year, year on year on year, we're adding 20 billion tonnes. Now, in order to stay below one and a half degrees centigrade rise, we, we will use up our carbon budget in the next eight years. So in eight years time, we will have lost any chance of staying within 1.5 degrees centigrade if we carry on at that rate. Now the thing, uh, this is not a climate change talk, but that may, makes me think, we know the science, this is very, very clear. We've known it for a very long time, for over a hundred years. Um, we know the science, but we don't accept the reality. If we think about traditional societies uh, from tens of thousands of years ago, they didn't know the science but they did have human stories which enabled them to live with the reality. So they have a, you know, they're able to live sustainably, not knowing the science. We're not able to live sustainably, having known the science. So that's a bit, a bit depressing, really. Also, I'd like to get, put this into context as well. The context of, uh, well, how long have humans been on, on this earth? How, how long have we actually been in contact with nature? Well, Homo sapiens, our species, has been around for at least 200,000 years, maybe more unlikely to be, to be less. So 200,000 years we've been on the planet. If we'd have gone back 190, 200,000 years and given somebody the iPad that I'm talking, talking to you on now, plus a little bit of training, they'd be better at it than I am. So they, we were the same then, okay? 200,000 years ago. Um, for 190,000 years, we were hunter-gatherers. That's 95% of our evolutionary history. The vast majority of our evolution, the vast majority of our history is as hunter-gatherers. We only developed agriculture in the last 10,000 years. Even within that last 10,000 years, most of that time was ad as agriculturalists. We are outside in nature. It's only in the last few decades, in the last couple of decades, that there are more people now living in cities than living out in rural areas. So for 99.9% .9 of our evolutionary history, we've been in nature. If we had gone 190,000 years ago and spoken to a hunter-gatherer at that time and said, well, where's the nature? He would have looked at, at us, he or she would have looked at us very confused. What on earth does that mean? It's like going into somewhere and saying, where's the place? No, they probably wouldn't have had a word for nature at all. They were so integrated with it. For the, for the following 10,000 years in agriculture, yes, they would have understood about nature. If we had, if we'd have said to them, where is the nature? They would probably have said, well, it, we live with it all the time. We're farming with it. It's, it's something we have to consider. They might have pointed to the forests or the wilds or the wastes as where nature actually is. It's in the margins as well. It's in the forests. So they would have pointed to somewhere where the nature was. They would have seen themselves living in nature all the time. Today, recently, if, we're just, if we say, where is the nature? then the sort of answer you'll normally get is, well, it's in a nature reserve over there. Some people go and visit it, perhaps. It could be a consumer choice if you want to do that. Maybe it's something the, the white and middle class might have time to do. Nature is over there somewhere. It's not where I am. It's not, uh, it's not, not part, of, part of my life. So for 99.9% .9 of our evolutionary history, we've been in contact with nature. It's only in the last 1%, 0.1% of our history, that we've been separated in this sort of way. Now that 
that that ecological separation uh, leads to physical isolation. We're physically isolated from the, by, through this ecological separation. Now this must lead to mental, uh, mental isolation as well. We can't expect to live in a way different to our 99.9% .9 of evolutionary history and there being no result. Well, let's find out whether, um, Paul, uh, you've, you've been listening to that, whether you've experienced what this, the effect of this disconnect can mean. Absolutely. Um, behind me is a beautiful scene of nature. And I'm sure all of us, when we go on vacation, when we spend time at weekends, we're naturally drawn to beautiful places. But the reality for most people's lives is very different. This is what a typical day looks like. We're staring at smartphones, we're staring at laptops, and in the evening when we're exhausted, we're staring at TVs. Most of us live in suburbs or cities, and yes, we will see trees, but we don't have the experience that many of us enjoy of living on the South Downs or in this beautiful park. And of course, there's the delightful car, which so many people spend hours in. So this is the modern landscape. And as you go through these pictures, notice how you feel compared to how it feels now to be looking at nature. Because what Tony has suggested in his talk is actually borne out now by modern research into psychological research and into neuroscience and physiology. But Disconnecting from nature is not just disastrous for, you know, for the environment, for, for wildlife, for species, it's actually really damaging to us. And there's a huge amount of research coming out over the last 20 years, and it goes back to a fascinating study in 1984 um, by Professor Robert Ulrich in Pennsylvania. And he studied over a period of many years um, the recovery rates of uh, people who'd had heart surgery in a number of hospitals in Pennsylvania. And what he found was those people who were looking out of windows at uh, trees in particular were recovering far more quickly than those people who were either looking at the built landscape or at a blank wall. But in fact, they were recovering more quickly they were in far less pain and that they had far less complications going forward uh, a whole period of time. Further studies have shown that even just looking at a picture of nature is better for you than looking at abstract art. Now as somebody who loves abstract art that was very disturbing for me but the fact is nature has a profound effect on us and it, we, there's been a number of concepts which I think are quite useful to add here. One is some um, concept of nature deficit disorder. We've heard of attention deficit disorder. Well, the concept of nature deficit disorder is that when we're taken out of nature, we actually suffer. And if you think of a typical life of most people, especially you know younger people, people in work, but to an extent all of us, we sleep in boxes, we wake up in a box, we, have, we eat in a box, we work in a box, and we go between the office and shops and home in a box. And what do we do most of the day? Stare at boxes. So we've created this artificial twilight world that I think is really bad for our well-being. And it's, it's vital that we balance it with as much time outdoors as possible. Now, a lot of people here, I suggest, and please um, raise your hands if you enjoy gardening at any level and have know what, how good it feels just to be out in the garden, whether you're working, whether you're sitting in the garden, just the experience of being in the garden is wonderful. The tragedy is for many people, um, they don't have that experience of nature. And nature is something you do, you have to almost organize a walk in the park or, or to go on holiday. We need to bring nature back into the core of everybody's lives. And the famous botanist um, biologist E.O. Wilson coined the phrase biophilia. And again, linking into what Tony said is we've, we are pretty much hunter gatherers in suits. You know, we might have advanced technologically and culturally, but in terms of physiological and psychological terms, 
This lifestyle is very toxic for us. We are supposed to be out in nature. We are supposed to be moving around. We are not supposed to be living this sedentary lifestyle in front of screens. And the concept of biophilia is that we have an innate love and empathy and feeling for nature. And it's, it's vital again, but we build it in. A particular area in my work is something you might not be so familiar with, which is the concept of eco-psychology. And this is a field that was developed in the 90s, but really said that we are living half a life and that we are so disconnected from nature, we are missing out on the full spectrum, the whole range of what it means to be human. And that the fact that we are destroying our, the very life support systems that give us life is a sign of pathology. It's highly dysfunctional. And that the, the goal to mental health, the path to mental health is reconnecting to nature. And in my work, I do a lot of work in mindful walking. And I encourage you all to walk barefoot on the earth every day. And when you go out, put away your phones. Don't think of what's happened. Don't think of the future. And just immerse yourself in nature. Feel the wind on your face. Listen to the bird songs. Experience the, the wonderful nature all around us. And I promise you that you will feel better. Well, thank you, Paul. I already feel better for hearing it, but I'm also feeling a bit guilty because I'm sitting here looking at a screen with everybody here talking about it. But it is a necessary evil for us to understand these issues more. And, and I just wanted to ask you as well, where there's disconnection, does it have an even bigger meaning in your mind? To me, it does. I feel that the great, one of the great um, chronic problems of Western society in particular is disconnection. We've become far more disconnected from nature, definitely, from each other, from communities, from institutions. Now, recently during the pandemic, we, in the lockdown, and I think we're going to have another one coming up, we, we had a glimpse of what it's like to reconnect to our neighbours, to our communities, and that, that feeling of, um, of well-being. And, and purpose and meaning that comes from connecting to other people. But we don't want to return to a society where we are focused on our individuality, where we are separate, where we're atomized. You know, Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society. And I think we know that that, that is wrong. And there was this, this rampant consumerism, individualism, which flourished in the 80s and 90s and still captures so much of popular imagination. So I think we need to go to go back to really connecting, not just to nature, not just to other people, but also to our better nature. And yet your better nature is the big theme of these talks. And I feel in my work in psychology, but we become disconnected from the tr our true self, which is a self that's very joyous, that is very loving, very compassionate, and wants to be out in nature. And I think we've got a quote that, that really sums it up for me, one of my favourite quotes I'd like to um, just show. We all know that Einstein was a scientific genius, but also he was an extraordinary, profound and wise man. And he said, and you might have heard this before, but I'd really like us just to focus on this quote. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings are something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. Um, this delusion is a kind of prison for us, and it's, it's restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. And our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty, because the true value of a human being is determined by the measure and the sense in which they have obtained liberation from the self. And we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if humanity is to survive. Thank you. Now, this was Einstein uh, a year before his death in 1954. And I still, 66 years on, um, I still think it's one of the most profound quotes because it brings all these different things together we have to widen our circle of compassion. You know, whether you're a meat eater or a vegetarian like myself, we slaughter uh, over a trillion fish every year and for over 300 million, billion animals that we know of and probably a lot more. And we have this industrialized destruction of our ecosystems, 
which is pathological. And even Einstein was beginning to see this towards the end of his life. So for me, it is about reconnecting to our better nature, to our compassion and to a unity and understanding that at the most profound level, we are all connected, we are all one. And the older I get, um, I become more spiritual. I'm not religious, but I become more spiritual. And for me, appreciating the sacredness of nature, whether it be a plant, whether it be the giant redwood, whether it be the most beautiful landscape in the world, is part of the living experience. And I, I feel really strongly that that is the key to connecting to your better nature. Well, thank you, Paul. That was really, really um, emotional and um, important to hear. Thank you for, for, for giving all of that to us. Um, Tony, when people hear that, you know, they're moved by it and they, they want to know, they want answers, they want to know how can we be more connected? You know, what needs to change? We need to look forward and think that there must be another way. What, what would you say? Well, there's several kind of key principles, key points that I'm just going to touch on a few thoughts that, are, that I've had because yeah, we, we can't just leave it there, can we? We need to think about a new relationship. And I think one of the first things I'll start with, but I don't want to develop too much, is the, is, is the point that we need to properly account for the value of nature. At the moment, we don't. Our, our current economics treats nature as an externality, something we don't even count. Uh, the damage to nature is not actually accounted for in, in econo economic assessments and the benefits we get from nature, they're not accounted for in standard economics. Now, this is just, it's not just bad for the planet. It's not just bad, e bad, bad ecology, it's bad maths. Now, if you've got two bank accounts, one big one and one small one, but you're only watching what happens to the small one, then you're, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to survive very well. So the old, the old, the old human story of nature is just an infinite thing that we can just exploit. Um, it, you know, as it's a result of not accounting fully for the, either the costs onto nature or the benefits from nature. When doing this, I, was, I really stress now that we must be very aware of bad descriptions of, of natural capital, of, of nature. This is not about pricing nature. It's not about working out the, the, the price or price tag that you put on bits of nature. Not at all. It's the other way around. It's actually, this is about a challenge to current economics. It's about naturalizing the economy, not about pricing nature. That's highly important. If this is done properly, it'll be a fundamental ch challenge to economics and it will change our human story. I just want to give you a quick example. Of if, if you actually do the sums, and there are many places around the world where this is done, and actually Britain used to be in the lead for how you do proper economics in this way. I'll give you one example. The West Country Rivers Trust looked at hull catchment and they worked out the cost of renaturalizing that catchment. If you actually turn that back to nature and managed it for nature. Now, normally that's the only thing you count. How much does that cost? But they didn't stop there. They looked at all the benefits that you would actually get that we normally ignore. The reduction in flood risk, the amount of carbon that's locked up, the improvement in terms of recreation, the reduction in erosion, the change in property values, all of these sorts of things, all of them can be measured. All of them are a vast underestimate, but they measured them just to see what sort of order of magnitude that would come in. And what, what is the value of all these benefits that we normally don't, don't cost? And the benefit to cost ratio was 60 to 1. 60 to 1. Now, even if they exaggerated 10 times, that's still 6 to 1. Now, if we, we talk about roads today and the, and the, the benefit cost of roads, they, they struggle to reach 3 to 1. So, you know, we're doing incredibly bad maths. Uh, as well as doing things that are bad for the environment. So we're actually accounting for things very badly. Now, there are a lot of good, good examples of good, uh, good references to this, but one I would really recommend, and I think it'll be in the chat line, uh, is a book by Tony Juniper called What Has Nature Ever Done For Us? Which is brilliant. It's full of all sorts of examples, really well worked examples of what happens when you really do look at the, the value that nature brings us and the problems if you don't actually account for that. So I recommend that book. However, this is still pretty anthropocentric, isn't it? This is still all about us, and it tends to fall back into kind of financial value. It tends to fall back into the economic frame, which I think we have to be very careful about. It is helpful in decision-making. Uh, that, that is how we make decisions, but we have to re realise the limits. Uh, nature has intrinsic rights. You know, I don't have to prove my economic value to stop you murdering me. Uh, a society doesn't have to prove its economic value to prevent genocide. Nature shouldn't have to prove its economic um, value in order to prevent 
ecocide. So ecocide is a thing that we really need to grasp here. So nature does have intrinsic value in itself. Um, accountancy must return, economics, accountancy, that must return to being the servant of the natural world and be the driving force behind its regeneration, not the driving force behind its exploitation as we see it now. I would just finish this, 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 this one little bit though by saying, I, I can't even remember who said it, but one, said, one person said something really quite wise, and that is, yeah, estimating the value of nature, that's great, but at the very best, all it is, is a poor approximation of infinity. Thank you for that. But, but then what, how do we express our support for nature if it's not in these economic terms? Well, yes, I mean, um, this is where we start to get to some, some core thoughts. And I, I think around, around the, the, whole, the whole subject of rewilding, uh, not just in terms of, of it being a way of delivering uh, environmental enhancement, a way of delivering conservation objectives, a way of bringing back our nature that's been lost, but actually, actually is something that's actually much, much wider than that. It's a philo philosophical point. Um, agriculture is the most damaging human activity on the planet. The United Nations, I think, estimated a few years ago that uh, we, we may only have 60 harvests left around the world before all our soil is gone. And that's just looking at the soil. Climate collapse means that we're probably bringing to an end a 10,000 year experiment as being agriculturalists. The likelihood is that we're going to return to being hunter-gatherers, the way that things are going now. Now I want to move quickly on from that because that sounds very doom and gloom. Um, I would also say that there are so many places bucking this trend. There are so many examples in the farming community and elsewhere which are bu bucking those general points. Agriculture can also be one of the most regenerative human activities. And we'll pick this up in a later webinar, I think, when we talk about regeneration. Uh, but perhaps the best way to seeing ourselves as part of nature, rather than being separate from it, is by, going, by thinking about, thinking through rewilding. So what do I mean by rewilding? What, what is rewilding? It's, it's often talked about and it's often dropped into conversations as just a point. Well, um, well rewilding is, is not about managing nature, if you can avoid it, it's actually about rebuilding nature. It's not about abandonment. It's, it's very different from just abandonment. It's about the positive restoration of natural processes. So we're restoring natural processes. Okay, so let's move that thinking on a bit. This recognises the primacy of nature. This is the key point. We must recognise the primacy of nature. If we rebuild the system, if we actually can put nature back together, and if we restore ecosystems, then it will run itself. Okay, so move our thinking on from that. It doesn't actually need us. <laughs> nature runs itself without us. If we rebuild it, we, we, we restore nature and rebuild new systems, then it will run fine. It doesn't need us. So that's a bit of a move on, thinking, well, actually, we are subordinate to it. So we need nature. It doesn't need us. So indeed, we're totally reliant on nature. I don't want to forget about sustainable agriculture as well, because that's a highly regenerative ag uh, activity as well. So careful stewardship through sustainable agriculture, through, through sustainable forestry, all those sorts of things, yet yeah, very important. But rewilding is about restoring the system and encouraging the system to run itself and seeing ourselves as part of that system, not its master. That's the key point. Part of the system, not its master. In this, in this sense, I think we see, sometimes see rewilding as a side issue, uh, a very nice thing to do, but a bit of a side issue to the, to the way we think normally. Um, maybe a special interest, maybe something the ecologists really like. Um, and so there's a thing come up in the chat line just now, a book called Wilding by Isabella, Isabella Tree. I really recommend that. That tells a whole story about rewilding at the Nepa State. Um, it's not, however, just a special interest. It's not only about restoring nature. It's actually about the core of a new human story. Restore the system. The system looks after itself. and We are part of that system. It sees us within the system, not on top of the, not on top of the system. Now, what does this mean to us? I mean, that sounds great. But if you haven't got somewhere the size of the Serengeti, is it really valuable? Well, well yes, it is. It's stressed, first of all, the thought process, the primacy of nature, rebuilding the system, being part of that system, uh, having a global perspective, but actually you can apply that locally as well. The old idea, think global, act local, yes, was a bit hackneyed, but it's dead right, it's, it's completely true. You can rewild your garden. Instead of really thinking about how you're going to make the garden be what you want it to be and get to the outcome at the end of it, you can think about, well, how does nature work in this area? How am I part of nature? You can apply these principles in your garden. You can certainly apply it in your community space. 
you can apply it in your neighbourhood, in your landholding. You can, local authorities can apply it to a whole district. How do we work with nature and become part of it on a larger scale? It's a practical application of rewilding at all scales. Um, rewilding you know, by itself will probably never be a dominant life, a dominant uh, land use, um, but it should never be competitive with agriculture. We do need to eat. Um, so it should be seen alongside the kind of careful stewardship principle as well. But I think rewilding ourselves, a new human story, moving away from our current human story, which is all about dominance and control, hierarchy, saying what has to happen, reaching an endpoint, planning, marching towards your endpoint, having dominance, having control, moving away from that towards putting good things in place, putting, put, making sure the system is really working well and actually letting it run. Well, I, I want to end it there, but I don't, because I know that you've got an amazing story about, well, walk us through some words. And if you don't mind ending with that story, then we can open it up. We've got some questions and comments coming in, and I'd love yeah. to bring people in. But yeah, um, sure. when you first told me about this, it, it really moved me. So I wouldn't, would like you to, to just yeah, well, take us for a walk in the woods. <laughs> sure, I'll take you for a walk in the woods. I was just thinking about how I could illustrate this, the old human story to the new human story, and, and how do we get there as well? We need to re restore ideas like our local area. Can we do nature maps so we know what's in our local area? Really reconnect with our local area. So localism is the important thing. But let's think about a walk in the woods. Let's think about a walk in the woods with our old human story. If we walked in the, in, in the woods with our old human story, it would be a timber production resource. Um, it would be there as a crop for exploitation. And um, so it's there, you grow it as a crop, and then after a while you harvest it. Um, if you do it badly, you destroy it. But actually that doesn't matter because you've converted that into financial capital. You've got your gain out of it. You've got your property. You can reinvest somewhere else. So it's a crop. You can destroy it, you take away the profit and you use it somewhere else. That's the old human story. In fact, you know, the profits would go elsewhere. They probably wouldn't even come to your local area. You probably wouldn't even be allowed in the area. Uh, the workers would probably be external contractors anyway, so it wouldn't come back to the area. A little value would accrue, accrue to the local, local people. But that's the, that's the kind of way we've been told it should be sometimes. It was actually the story more predominant in the 20th century. Where we are now, I think we're having a partial transition away from that human story if we have a walk in the woods. We are seeing forests as a sustainable resource. You know, in the past, we might have seen, said forest, but we'd be thinking plantation. Now we're thinking forest, and we're actually thinking, well, sustainable resource. If we manage it well, then actually you can keep it forever. You can actually make it restore. You can restore it and get a produce forever. But it's only a partial transition because we're keeping the old story. And if you're only sustain, if you're, you're managing one forest sustainably, but society is always wanting more and more and more of everything and everything, then that's, that's only going to be a small component of a larger system. So it's going to be a declining component and an ever increasing demand. So that's only a partial transition. So imagine if we have a new human story. Uh, I think things would, we would see things very differently. A walk in the woods would be a walk through a storybook. Uh, we wouldn't be thinking resource and profitability, we'd be thinking place and how are we part of this place? This is our place, we belong here, we're familiar with it, it's our local place, so it's our place. We would read the history of that place, you'd read the history of the wood in the structure of the trees and in, 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 and in the landform of its, uh, of, its, of its soil structure and in the plants that you'd see, you'd read the history of the place. You'll see the links to the products that that wood would provide, just like in the old days when there used to be like this, but to, con it may, to contemporary use, modern, modern uses of wood fibre, for example, you'd see those products growing there. You'd know who was harvesting that wood. You'd know them as part of the community. You'd know their family. You'd have links. You'd have a stake in the area. You would see, or at least understand, if you can't see, you would understand um, the carbon that was being locked up. You would understand the soils that were being built up at the time as well. You would understand how the wood was helping reduce your flood risk, how it was reducing erosion, how it's maintaining the soils and how it's spreading biodiversity everywhere as overspill goes into the surrounding areas. You'd understand that. I think over, in an overriding sense, you would see the wood as a system. You would see it as a the forest, as a functioning ecological system, a very rich functioning ecological system. Uh, one that you can actually learn from. You would cherish the area, you would actually learn from it and actually uh, treat it as a system that you could learn from. You would actually try to emulate that. For example, in sustainable management of your garden, maybe have maybe a forest garden 
maybe a permaculture garden or a forest food garden. You'd learn from the system how you could actually then make use of it because you were thinking of it as a place, as a system, not just as a resource to exploit. And in this, you would see the past and our ancestors as well, written in the forest. And you would see yourself as a good ancestor to future generations by supporting a system that is self-sustaining in perpetuity. The value of the forest would also be as much in the simple existence of the place for re recreation as recreation, uh, for inspiration, for creative arts, for health, for well-being, and as a place for providing all sorts of practical benefits. And I'll just by finish, if, you, if, you're, if you're in that mindset, if you're thinking of the place in that sort of way, then actually the old story of the need for growth would kind of not exist anymore because you would be thriving whether or not your economy is growing rather than growing whether or not you're thriving. And now you know why I wanted you to tell that story. For those who are listening, I think it's magical and it's a wood that I want to be in. And it's a story we want everybody to learn to tell um, and to share. So thank you for that. Um, we've had uh, a few comments. Uh, I think most people have been enthralled and been listening um, so intently. They haven't felt like typing on their screen, which is great, actually. But we've just had a question from Mike Croker to you, Tony. Is the concept of biodiversity net gain of any real useful, use of any real useful to nature value in the context of new housing developments? Yes, it is. But again, like with so many things, it's got to be applied properly. I mean, I've heard the idea of net gain being used as a kind of balancing act, which actually means you can lose some things here if you can gain something over there. Well, actually, you have to be very careful with those sorts of balancing acts, because what tends to happen is something inconvenient might actually be very valuable. But don't worry, we'll do it over there as well. We'll replace it with something else. So there has to be a proper understanding that some, some lines you don't go over. You don't fell an ancient woodland in order to build some secondary plantation, even if it is much bigger. So there are lines in the sand. The concept of net biodiversity gain used properly could actually be a driving force in actually making sure that our planning and our house building delivers regeneration, not just reduces its damage. So yes, I'd say, yes, the concept of net biodiversity gain, but we must actually drive it positively, not kind of lose the idea of, of by, by having it as a license to trash in one place in the hope you might do something somewhere else. Thank you. And Lee Walther um, asked um, both of you, perhaps um, Paul, you can pick up on this. How do we share these stories when the old media is so dominant? Well, a very good question. Um, you know, one of the challenges which we're confronting, if you like, in, in this series is to really look at the, the systemic blocks to change. I think everybody here wants to do something about climate breakdown. Everybody here wants to do something about the ecological collapse, but how do we do it when the media is owned by a few billionaires who are more interested in corporate profit than getting, you know, these stories out there? But there are, we've put up some books on the side. It's amazing how books, which when I first worked in the environment, you might have had 50 readers, are now on the Sunday Times bestseller list. Books about, you know, how nature and gardening is healing. These stories are starting to get out because they're speaking to a universal human yearning for change, a very deep part of us, our deepest needs. And it's cutting across all those what we call pseudo satisfiers, you know, the need for status, power, making more money. And it's speaking to our, the essence of who we really are. And we need to get those stories out in videos like we're doing now, telling them to people, telling them to our children in particular, but there are, you know, there are always outlets and publishers are, are very interested in this now. You know, the BBC, doc, there are more and more documentaries appearing now. If you go to Netflix and Prime even, there's some very radical um, videos and films on which are challenging the status quo. And we'll be looking at those in other webinars too. Thank you. Um, and Anne, uh, maybe this one's actually for Tony. Uh, would you comment on losing an ancient woodland to build a reservoir as is happening here in Havant. They're talking about creating a wetland area and doing woodland improvements elsewhere as compensation. I think this is really what you were talking about, that some of these yeah. net gains are not really gains at yeah. all. Exactly, I mean, this is where it's done badly and I've fought cases in the past where, where, where yes, a, a reservoir can only be where you've got a dent in the ground. And if there's actually a, an ancient woodland there, then they try to fight an argument to say, well, it's okay, because we're gonna build a woodland somewhere else. 
it doesn't work like that. You know, rebuilding an ancient wood is like trying to give birth to an old age pensioner. You can't do it. So actually there has to be lines in the sand the way that you don't cross. Yes, net gain. If you're going to do a development, then it has to be net gain. Destroying an ancient woodland, even if you replace it with something 10 times the size, is a net loss. So, so no, a reservoir that actually is damaging ancient woodland is fundamentally breaking those sorts of ideas. So no, you can't have your reservoir there. And what's more, when you put it somewhere else, you're going to have to deliver proper net gain. Right, we've heard it there. So how optimistic, asked Tim Rose, do you feel about achieving a combination of rewilding and sustainable farming at a scale in a world populated by 8 billion people? Do you see practical roots to that? Yes, I certainly do. Yeah, because uh, this is a question that comes up a lot. You do rewilding, yes, that's okay, but it won't feed the world. Well, several answers to that. First of all, rewilding projects are done in some of the least productive areas anyway. Some of the, air, some of the farms that were actually failing badly, so the, the rewilding is done in the least productive areas. Uh, but also, the way we're, we're not feeding the world at the moment. Our agricultural system is fundamentally flawed in all sorts of ways. Incredibly inefficient. Yes, it produces a large amount of uh, food per unit area. The question we should ask is how many people are fed by that unit area? And because of things like waste, because of the way we use food, or the way we transport it, we're actually feeding quite a small number of people on a unit area of land. The most efficient form of farming is probably something like permaculture. Forest food gardens produce many times as much food as the most productive wheat field. So we actually, we're, we're fed a line that actually we have to have intensive farming to, to feed the world. It's, it's not quite like that. I'm sure we need some intensive farming. I'm not gonna slag off all the farmers, certainly, because that's very important. But actually there are many other ways of doing it. And I think this idea of a false, of a dichotomy, uh, we're not gonna feed the world because we're gonna rewild everywhere. I think that's very false. I think actually these, these work together. The other thing, because I could talk all day about this, but the other thing that, that um, needs to bear, bear in mind is that we think long term. We are losing soils. It's turning out the best way to build up soils is rewilding. So if you do rewilding, even for a short period, say 15 years, you could see that as long term fallow. You're rebuilding your soils so you can then feed the world again. Thank you for that. And uh, Keith, oh, sorry, Keith and Leanne um, said, Henri Bergson said, the eye only sees what the mind is prepared to comprehend. Um, maybe Paul can pick this up, but most people are so disconnected with nature and connected with advertisers who sell fly killer, ant nest destroyer and green fly sprays. As Lee has pointed out already, we need a different tactic. What can it be? Very good question. Well, next week's webinar is specifically addressing how we have been framed as consumers within society and how we've lost our identity, in some respects, our very soul to, to the marketeers, to modern um, materialist and cons consumerist culture. And it's, we're gonna try and reset things. So we're gonna be going into some, some depth in the next session on that. But for the time being, I don't, I'd like to just step back and look at the, all of the webinars as a totality. You know, Tony and I are talking about some pretty dreadful facts. You know, I talked about the number of animals being slaughtered. We've talked about the, you know, the extraordinary damage being done to our climate. But our actual goal, our mission, if you like, for your better nature, is to is to put forward a very positive vision and an alternative vision. And what people need to know far more of is that life could be so much better when you reconnect with nature, when you eat organic food, when you pull yourself away from all the consumerist conditioning, and to show people a very positive alternative. In our little community in Stenning, Bramber and Upper Beading, you know, we've got a project called the 2030 Project going, and we're out to prove that our community will not only just be greener, but will be healthier and happier. The knowledge is out there, the tools are out there, the resources are out there. And what we need to do is all of us contribute at individual, family, community, organisational level to proving that it works. And that's what we're here to help us, you know, help you do. As you say, we'll be talking about more of this in the, in the next um, webinar, but, but Carrie Courts raised a really good point, which has also been raised before, but it is about how do we ensure, you know, we know a lot of people in COVID times have spent more time in nature, which is fantastic and discovered for the first time, many of them, the benefits of nature. But how do we ensure that these so-called non-greenies don't lose sight of this? 
as we keep that momentum going because we absolutely know that we can't just speak to our own echo chamber yes how do we answer that that's an interesting okay. question isn't it i mean uh, david attenborough i think when he was asked a question like that i think he was asked uh, he was asked by somebody where did you get your interest in wildlife and he turned around and he said well where did you lose yours uh, i think we have a natural a natural biophilia which is always there and uh, I think, as we, we said in previous webinars, we just, just have to find what the trigger is. And it may not be wildlife at all. It may actually, and health is a really important one. You know, if, you, uh, if, if you're thinking about your health and what you can do to improve your health, it nearly always will involve nature. And that can actually be a way into un to understanding more. So health is very important. Thinking about not saving your planet, but actually saving your family. Thinking about your family, about the future of that. Thinking about the great the great cycles of life that actually enable us to live. I mean, you can boil that down and it becomes a really interesting story. So I think, yes, it's, it's very important. I think we sometimes feel that we're uh, pushing against a more closed door than we actually are. I've often been pleasantly surprised by people who know absolutely nothing about wildlife and you'd think are just a, I don't know, a stuffed suit who doesn't care and they come out with something, not exactly inspired, but it shows that they're really thinking about it. Uh, I think there's been studies, maybe, maybe Paul knows about them, you know, uh, uh, people naturally sit under trees for shade, not under concrete buildings. We naturally sit next to rivers and things like that. Uh, we, why do we have pets? Because we want that contact with nature. We don't necessarily think of ourselves as, as an ecologist as we have a dog on our lap that we're petting. And yet we have biophilia, we have to have that contact with nature. Yeah, if I, if I can just add something, I agree with everything Tony said, but there's another way of reframing this, I think. And it's not about necessarily adding anything to people's lives. It's not about even educating people. It's more about removing all the barriers, all the persona we've built up to reveal our true state, going back to the poll right at the beginning. Most of us, and I suspect all of us at some level, would have had our most wonderful early experiences outside, but we lose sight of it. We lose sight of it, not because of us, but because of our culture. And what we're doing is reconnecting people to our true selves, our, tr our better nature. This is, again, we keep on coming back to that. But we're not, this isn't about going and getting a degree or learning lots of new skills. It's about getting rid of all the barriers and all the layers that prevent us having this natural connection. Well, I've been fascinated by both of you this evening. And uh, thanks very much for everybody for their comments and their thoughts. And, we can't wait to hear what else you've got to say on the subject when you start to digest some of the very meaty uh, thoughts and uh, facts that you've been given tonight. Everything will be available um, on YouTube for you to, to be able to look at again. Um, just before we go, um, we always have a, a little goodie bag. Um, so we have John Ruskin's wonderful quote here, there is no wealth but life. And we are looking at changing the language so that nature is a, a nice to have luxury. It is our life support system. Uh, a healthier, better nature is also better for our nature. We've uh, referenced quite a few books tonight. You've got some of them in the chat as well, which we Viv did a marvelous job after the first webinar of, of collating all that information and passing it on to you. And she will again. And there's a lighter reference here as well, which will be made available for you. Um, you're very welcome, Carrie, just what the doctor ordered tonight. So thank you for, for that comment. Um, and next week, episode three, we are citizens, not consumers. So we'll be looking into that subject, which was raised tonight about how consumerism can cloud some of this closeness to nature. And we are available on email, on YouTube, on Facebook, and you can contact Paul and Tony on their Twitter feeds as well. So much to do. Um, before we go, we like to end by seeing you all. So if you <laughs> feel free to be unmuted. I don't know if yeah, I'll unmute you all. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Have a good evening. Oh, hi, Carrie. <laughs> 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 Lucky. It's been an excellent evening. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming Thank and sharing you. it with us, and and we hope Same to see you next that. week um, yes. for, for more more thought thought provoking <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for thank you for joining us. More. Who's <laughs> the best?